Our goal with this channel is to explore the vast world of global martial arts and get comfortable with stepping outside of our own styles to see how others practice. Today, we have a very special guest that is on the same mission. Sensei William Christopher Ford, often recognized for his role of Dennis in The Karate Kid Part 3, is here with us today to talk about his experience with Shorin Ryu Karate, his exploration of contrasting martial arts, and if you stick around to the end, we'll have some fun uh, Karate Kid 3 behind the scenes moments. So we'd like to give a warm welcome to Sensei William Christopher Ford. How did you come across the martial arts? What art did you start in? Was it, was it Shorin Ryu? Well, um, yes and no, and I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that. Uh, my first exposure to martial arts was through the original Kung Fu show with David Carradine. <laughs> and I hadn't even taken karate at the time. It was seven years old. And I was like, I was a kid, but that was a show that was on and it became my favorite show. It was, it was the first time I'd seen martial arts ever. He, he walked around with almost like superpowers and I couldn't wait to, to watch him every week. After that, my, my parents took me to a local theme park here in California called Japanese uh, Deer Park, which was, um, it was a theme park that was based on Japanese culture. An experience would be like to kind of go to like Kyoto, Japan, whereas there was koi ponds and the, that kind of decor. And, Japanese dance and whatnot. And one of the things they also did was they had a live karate show that was um, hosted and performed by Sensei Fumio Demura and his students. Back then he was kind of a trailblazer. Now this was, he was already, you know, on kind of on the, on a few magazines and things like that, but that was before he became super famous, becoming the stunt double for Mr. Miyagi and all that. But his, his show was very theatrical, very dramatic, very exciting. And it was like watching, almost like watching a scene from a movie. And that was the first time I'd experienced karate live. And you can feel the power and the energy and, and all that. And then shortly thereafter, uh, a friend of mine, I remember, I think I was around seven years old or so. I was, I was um, had started taking karate at the local dojo. And he, was only at it for maybe a couple more months more than I was, but he was already kind of positioning himself as sort of like the uh, karate expert, <laughs> you know, and he was showing me things. And he also said, you've got to come and join the dojo now, you know, you got to come, you got you to take it. So, okay. And I went down there and I met a man named Glenn Robago. And I thought I had to talk like Kwai Chen Kane. So, you know, here's, since Glenn Rubago, and he's just this brother from Hawaii. I said, yes, master, but first, may I use your bathroom? And he just kind of looked at me strangely. And my mom was just like, you know, what is going on? So I went and I got my uniform and that was my first day. Now, I only trained with Sensei Glenn Rubago for a few months. He, um, he, was a, he was a great martial artist, but had a lot of uh, demons and... Um, it, it showed up in class and you know, now you're dealing with little kids, you know, and so there's, there's a difference between running a tight ship and, you know, having discipline and also, mm, you know, the, the, you could, you could physically abuse kids and, you know, it, it, it wasn't a good environment and I definitely wanted to quit. But fortunately his brother, Richard Rubago took over the dojo and I really thrived under his, um, his teachings. And it was, Shorin Ru Karate. And the reason why I got into that was just because it happened to be the local dojo. That's happened to be what they were teaching. You know, had it been something else, you know, we might be talking about, you know, Kung Fu or Taekwondo or, or, or something else right now. But that was the one that I started with. And that's what I ended up sticking with. When you like something, you practice more. And when you practice more, you get better at it. And when you get better at it, you tend to like it more. And when you like it more, you practice more. And when you practice more, you get better at it. And so it's this wonderful cycle that just feeds in on itself that makes you better and better. And pretty soon, you know, now 48 years have gone by and I'm still a student of the martial arts. I hope to inspire the kids that, I, that I'm with by my example. So in your school, you teach, uh, do you teach a mixture of arts or is it still primarily Shorin Ryu? Well, Shorin Ryu is the base art, you know, that's where kind of our foundation is. You know, I'm a big fan of 
the four basic punches of boxing, jab, cross, hook, uppercut, you know, the, the, the head movements that you have, you know, with your slips and, you know, things like that. I'm a fan of the way that the ties kick. Uh, I'm a fan of grappling, you know, be it, you know, catch wrestling or jujitsu. So there's a lot of good stuff out there. Filipino martial arts. Um, we're very quickly, my students are very quickly putting their hands here. And yes, we do chamber on the hip or the ribs, but I'm limiting that to my kata practice. You know, that, that's where my art lives. That's where the history of the art lives. You know, yes, there is a purpose for that, but I'm also finding that if I can get my, you know, my, my students to keep their hands up here, they, they tend to get hit a little bit less, you know, <laughs> especially especially coming in with somebody, somebody trying to get you with a hook. And I was like, oh, there, there it is. You know, you can at least you know, cover or get out of the way or, or block or, you know, whatever you need to do. I have found that by going outside my art, so to speak, I have found things, by able to look at things in a different perspective that may have already been in my original art, but I just didn't recognize it. You know, there are mm -hmm. throws and grappling and things like that, that are, you know, they've either been hidden or forgotten, or, you know, maybe they were never intended to be there, but because I'm looking at things through a new lens, suddenly I'm able to see a movement and go, you know, that could be a throw, you know, and, and, and not even realizing it. So I, I think that for me, going outside my art has actually allowed me to be better at my art. So speaking of the history of the art, um, Shorin Ryu is pretty much one of the oldest forms of Okinawan Karate. How does it stem from Shurite? Like, what are some notable differences? You know what? Um, the differences that I've noticed in a lot of the Okinawan styles are in the kata, you know. Um, you know, the stances in Okinawan Karate tend to be higher and you know, the theory was for more mobility, but the way that I was taught my Shorin Ru was we favored lower stances and not and not like maybe as low as like a Shotokan stance. The theory behind that was that, you know, if you can learn to move quickly from a lower stance, then it will be there when you go to a higher stance. Interestingly enough, there are there are no round kicks in any of our kata, you know, plenty of front kicks, um, some side kicks, but no mawashigeri. So there are some theories out there, you know, in regards to well, where did the what where, where did the roundhouse come from? And, and and we use it all the time. So I don't know if that was even part of the original, you know, um, art, you know. And if you talk about the original art, you know, the indigenous art, you know, tea. You know, there were influences that came in from you know, Southeast Asia and other parts, you know, of the world, you know, and, and karate is a relatively new term, you know, I think the early 1930s is when it was actually like coined karate and even the calligraphy was changed from like China hand to empty hand. It, you know, it, it's, it's all very similar, more, more, more similarities than differences, in my opinion. You know, things are different when you have resistance training, right? It's, it, nobody leaves their hand out, right? You know, when you train, yeah, it's like, you know, okay, we're going to train this technique and you, we're going to go slow. But it's different when you're working with your partner, you know, even if it's just, hey, let's do some, let's just do some free grappling and see what happens. And somebody is not cooperating, it's a little different. That's a big part of the, um, what I think is important in training is, uh, Let's pressure test. Let's resist. Um, I do want to go back to the statement you made because I wanted to ask you about the punches because there seems to be this debate about the vertical and the horizontal punches. How yeah. does punching, how does punching differ in Shorin Ryu versus, like, can you elaborate on what this debate is? You know, I, I, I can only tell you what I was taught and I was always taught, we, we always did, we never did the, the vertical punch really. It was either that or it was that. It was either canted or horizontal and I was always taught the first two knuckles you know never punch with the pinky obviously that's uh seems to have been what worked and then later on when I started incorporating more of, of the boxing then it was okay how do you bring it around in a circle and when I was first taught that we, we had an assistant instructor over at the school named Dave Lou and uh, he was highly influenced by boxing and, and Bruce Lee and whatnot and uh, that was the first time I'd actually learned how to throw a hook. The first time I learned, I, I threw a hook. I was like, 
And I thought, oh, that's the stupidest punch I've ever seen. It doesn't work, you know? And he was like, no, 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 no. You know, you got to put your shoulder into it. You got to turn your hips, you know? And, you know, that body mechanics are body mechanics where they'd be boxing or, or karate, right? It's like, okay, there's got to be a rotational force. You've got to move towards your target. There's got to be some velocity, so on and so forth. And then pretty soon it was like, oh, you know, I don't even have to work that hard and just by doing the technique. Um, but I also discovered that it's like, oh, you know, in katas like Naihan Chi, we have punches that are kind of like a hook punch. And if you just kind of bring it up and you can either turn it this way or turn it this way, it, it can be a good thing. There's a lot of debate whether, okay, do you hook this way or do you hook this way? I, I like them both. I think they both, you know, they both work. Um, so I teach them both. So Shorinru um, has a lot of circular motions to it, correct? It's a, it's a very circular based art. What people don't know about me, a lot of people, is that one of the people that I learned from that I that actually was my sensei sensei was a man named Tadashi Yamashita. If you Google Tadashi Yamashita, he he does come up. He's one of the um, I would say the pioneers, you know, of of the um, American karate movement. But if you ever looked at the way he moved, um, he did a lot of circular motions, and so you know he was doing stuff where you come in and parry this way, come over the top, come back this way, come here, break the arm, come back this way, you know, break the shoulder. And for years I was like, oh, you know, Shoranaru is a very, very circular art, but I didn't necessarily see it in our kata. I didn't see it reflected in our kata, except for maybe when we do this thing called, you know, kake uke or kake, kake uke, you know, where it's sort of like a parry and this one comes in here. This, this almost looks like Filipino martial art, right? Where you're checking here and you're striking here, right? But he was good friends with a man named um, Tino, Tino, Tino Tolusiga, um, founder of Lima Lama. There was a Chinese Polynesian influence that he had adopted. And eventually he combined his Shorinu Karate with that, in my opinion, I may be wrong. And he called it Sui Kendo, which kind of translates as fists being the way of water. And if you look at him demonstrate, it's like, that doesn't look like your typical karate movement, you know, he's, he's blinding fast, you know, like just a blur. And, you know, being on the receiving end of that as Uke for a few years, you know, it was just like, I don't know how many times he slapped me, but it was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if there is that conception of Shurunru being circular, um, but there's only one kata that I practice that has circular motion in it, and it's called Goju Shiho, and it, it has movement like this, where you're you're moving like this, and then you go into a spear hand, and then another spear hand. Everything else is mostly linear. And I want to use that topic of you know mixing the arts and different influences to segue into your channel, Kaizen Dojo Films. And if I understand correctly, Kaizen means continuous improvement. Is that correct? It so. is a uh, Japanese word that has come to mean in modern times, continual improvement. It was adopted by the Toyota Corporation within their company culture. And that's how I really first heard of it. And I started doing some research on it. And when we opened up the dojo 10 years ago, I thought Kaizen Dojo was kind of a cool way to describe how we teach and what we teach. You know. The idea of continual improvement not only as martial artists but as human beings and as long as somebody is continually improving in some way then you're succeeding now tell us about the iconography of your logo is there a significance to the turtle oh the <laughs> i'm glad you asked that um the turtle is my connection to hawaii and um my mother is um my mother is from japan but i she believes her father was actually Hawaiian. And we have a lot of family who live in Hawaii. So that, that's my connection to Hawaii, but also the turtle in Hawaiian is called a honu. And to me, that represents connection to nature, longevity, and wisdom. But the, the Honu, the legend is, is that she was a goddess who was able to transform herself into a woman and she would stand on the beach and watch over the children to make sure that they were safe. So I like that legend. And so I wanted to incorporate the, the Hawaiian Honu into 
uh, our dojo logo. And then if you'll notice that there's the shell, which represents defense, but then the fins are blades. So, you know, the turtle is thought of as being a very, um, not a predator, it's a docile creature, but I wanted to have the symbology of um, the shell being defense and the fins being offense if we need to use them. And if you look on the logo itself, there is the kanji for Kaizen right in the middle. And that's what we talked about, continual improvement. The red dot represents Japan, which is where my mother's from. The red dot with the circle inside represents Okinawa, where my heart comes from. And then you will see a star, the stars and stripes is represents the US where I was born. And then we have the three pronged, um, some people call it the three tiers. If you look at, if you look at the negative of it, it, it's, it's like three tiers. But if you look at the black part of it, it's like three blades. And you oftentimes see that associated with martial arts from Okinawa. But if you go further back, there is um, one of the uh, gods was the god of war called Hachiman. And the, one of the samurai clans, would uh, they adopted that three-pronged thing. It was like the symbol of Hachiman. And the Okinawan version of it is like, it's a little bit thicker and it looks a little bit more like a like the blade of a kama so um there's some history with that but thank you for asking that most people don't most people don't think to ask me that so they're, oh, they're, i love they're the logo i find it very striking it's very the colors are so bold like it, it just stands out and i've always thought it was a very striking image so i was really curious to know what the meaning behind it was because it looked like it was very deliberate in its design it was and i do appreciate that um that, that the, you know you took the time to ask and when I started the YouTube channel and I started, you know, wanting to create little films about martial arts and show uh, shows, uh, documentaries, things like that, I just decided to call it Kaizen Dojo Films. And that's a perfect segue to my next question because I absolutely love what you're doing with the channel, your whole series on the 52 Masters and how you're working to bridge the gap and understandings and bring different education, different arts together so people can see that there's a lot more out there. Um, what was the original motivation of your channel and how did you transition to the series and tell us a little bit about 52 masters? Well, you know, the original motivation of the channel was just to, you know, create some awareness about the dojo. It was more like, Hey, you know what? You gotta, you gotta get some videos out there. You know, you gotta, you know, it, it, it helps the algorithm of, you know, the Google searches and things like that. Then I discovered that I enjoyed interviewing people. What I eventually got really comfortable with was, uh, you know, first of all, people would say, oh, you know, you're, you're pretty good at this. You know, you're easy to talk to. And then that's when I, you know, I really honed in on that, being able to not talk to people, but talk with people, communicate with them, get them comfortable, have it be a conversation, not a monologue, talking about martial arts, how they got started in it, like you and I are doing, how we got started in it, what's our philosophy, See, I'm, I'm 55 years old now. I'm going to be 56 this year. The, the idea behind 52 Masters was when I was 51, I wanted to do something to celebrate turning 52. And so 52 experts, 52 black belts, 52 people who are pretty good, 52 Masters. Ah, that's the one. 52 Masters is a good, is a catchy title. So that's how that was born. And the original concept was, let's go to celebrate turning 52. Let's take the next 52 years, the 52 weeks, and train with one master per week, document the training, and then do an interview. I've, it's, I haven't finished the series yet, and, you know, and I'm not going to change it to 56 masters. <laughs> but I only have 15 more episodes to go or so. So I'm, I'm almost there. So, but mark my words, I, I, I will finish. You know, I, I got to finish. Well, for anybody watching at this point, guys, I do recommend going and check out the channel because there's quite a few right there now and it's a lot of material to watch and it's so fascinating to watch because I, I love the structure you do too because you guys, you do the introduction and then you do a training, like a drill training session and then you do the sit down and talk after that. And I think that's such a great reflection that you can offer right after showing a little bit of the art. So I, I love the format. So I, I can't, I, I can't recommend the show enough. <laughs> Uh, I appreciate that, and I appreciate it even more coming from you because, you know, you do something similar. You know, it's a different flavor, but you're basically doing the same thing I'm doing. 
you know, and you're you're experiencing something and you're sharing it without jealousy, without judgment, without selfishness, you know, and, and that to me, you know, shows that you're a true martial artist and, and a true teacher, you know, because you're giving something to someone that's of, of value if, if they want to dive in. There's there's these nuggets of wisdom there. And and people want that. Sometimes I'm surprised at the you know, you know how skilled somebody is, but you know, you hear about it and then, but when you experience it, it's like, oh my gosh. You know, who knew? It makes that, it real. Yeah. Somebody who like, wow, I didn't know that they could generate that much power or oh my gosh, this person is brilliant. Um, you know, when you feel somebody's power, you know, up close and personal, my friend Michelle Manu, who you know, I've known for years and years, you know, just but being able to experience in that with her but they also have a tremendous amount of self-control. They don't hurt you. You know, they're not trying to show you how good they are. You don't have to. Now, you also have a very um, touching, sentimental episode up there, a documentary chronicling um, Sensei Fumio Demura's last school. Can you tell us about The Last Dojo? That project is very dear to my heart. It's probably, it's probably the piece that I'm the proudest of. And it came about because my own instructor, Sensei Richard Rubago, he had a dojo close to mine about, he had it for over 35 years. And the landlord told him, hey, you know, Carlos Jr. wants to expand and get a drive through So that means it basically made me an offer I couldn't refuse. So you guys got to go. So somebody calls me up and says, hey, you know, Sensei Rubago's dojo is closing. No, that, that can't be. And, I call him up and he confirms that. And so I said, why don't you come to my dojo and train, you know, here are the off times when I'm not teaching a class. And that's what he did for about six weeks. And then he passed away. He had a um, uh, heart condition and uh, he passed away in his sleep. His cousin, Kurt Abduhan, came by to pay his respects at my dojo. And I had, um, I have, a, I have a piece of the original dojo floor that was salvaged. This was, you know, a, a plank. And this was something we all used to train on. And it has 35 years of DNA and sweat and blood and energy and all that. And I was able to salvage this. I got this. And so I put it out on Facebook. I said, hey, anybody who has trained with Sensei Robago at this dojo, come by and sign the back of this thing. Uh, Uncle Kurt came by. He signed it. And he's also an Emmy Award winning cinematographer. And he says, is there anything, let me know if there's anything I can do for you. And I said, well, you know that Sensei Demura is kind of going through the same thing that Sensei Robago is. The city is saying I'm in a domain and that you got to get going pretty soon. So they're, they're trying to close this dojo down. We went to Sensei Demura's dojo. He was kind enough to be interviewed and Kurt took all the b-roll of all the dojo he took pictures of the pictures on the walls and everything and the, the old doors and the mats and he comes back and he says i think we have something more here than just in there so he comes back to my dojo we do it at night and he interviews me when it was put together and edited by nate joseph and the music by Randy Miller was inserted in. You know, it was composed for the movie itself. It, um, it became a 20 minute little gem. It's my love letter to Sensei Demura and his students and anybody who's trained in a traditional dojo. The dojo isn't there anymore. And the good thing is that Sensei was, he was paid by the city and he has been at the dojo. But that dojo was there for almost 50 years. So yeah. there's a lot of memories there. But the sad thing is also is that the city basically kind of changed their mind because there's a McDonald's on the corner and they said, uh, no, we're not, we're not going. And the city backed down. So it all came down to uh, the almighty dollar. You know, it was, it was really about money and McDonald's wasn't about to leave. So since this dojo was destroyed, Really for no good reason. For nothing. And, um, and everybody who came together, including Sensei Demra, 
to participate in that, you know, made it super special. And um, um, if, if your viewers could go and watch The Last Dojo, it is on YouTube, you can watch it for free. It's, uh, it's going to be on Amazon very soon also, but it's, uh, it's the piece that I'm most proud of, maybe more than anything I've ever done. You can just feel the soul because I, I watched it just recently and like I, yeah. I, I, I put it on just to kind of watch it for a second and I found myself just totally into the whole thing and it's so you can feel the soul of the school you can see the history of the school it's so beautifully filmed that it really it's like as a viewer you can feel the loss even just through the video of what happened and the travesty of it but it, it's yeah. a it's a wonderful piece so absolutely I would recommend this to anyone who's interested to get a little piece of history with that. So with your channel too, I noticed that you also like to throw in a little bit of levity here and there. And with that being said, I have to ask you, how is your relationship with uh, rice paper Japanese screens these days? <laughs> well, um, I'm thinking about founding a style called shoji Ru, you know, <laughs> you know based on uh, my infamous destructing and destroying of shoji screens in the film Karate Kid 3, where I played Dennis the menace, you know, Cobra Kai henchman and uh, trainer of the bad boy of karate, Mike Barnes. So uh, my relationship is okay, you know, but I think I still have some issues, you know. <laughs> I think Dennis is still walking around with a shoji screen under his arm and he's got some, he's definitely got some issues, you know, but he's, he's trying. <laughs> I love that film. I, I watched it when I was 10. And I just, I mean, I, I love the whole trilogy, but I, I watched that one so much. And um, so I just have to, your curiosity. When, when you got the role of Dennis, were you given any sort of a backstory to him? And if not, what do you imagine his backstory was and how did he get tangled up with uh, Terry Silver? You know what? It was basically, they were under the gun. They needed a henchman and I henched. So, you know, I, I, I had originally auditioned for the part role of Mike Barnes. Didn't get that. I thought that was done. I get called in like a day before production is supposedly starting. I go down and I meet Pat Johnson. He looks me over. Yeah, you look okay to me, but it's really up to John. Now, previously I had gone to the open call that Sean Keenan had gone to, 1500 kids. And um, it was like, John came out and, and, and actually talked to me. Most of the people he didn't talk to, but came over and talked to me. I gave him my picture and resume. He said, how old are you? I said, 22. He says, you look too old. You need somebody who looks like they're right out of high school. The day before we start, we were supposed to start productions and rehearsal. I'm back down on the lot. John comes in, says, well, how old are you? I said, 22, sir. He goes, ah, you look young enough. Let's hire him. <laughs> and then Sensei Demer was there that day because he was the stunt double for Pat Morita, obviously. He saw me, he recognized me because, you know, I'd gone to his tournament years past, you know, he knew my mom, you know, we had maintained a friendship over the years and he actually vouched for me when John came out and he says, John, this kid, okay. And John was like, good enough for Sensei, good enough for me. Let's hire him. In regards to the name, I actually, they, they asked me, what do you want to name your character? And I was like, uh, uh, uh. And I thought, Dennis, Dennis the Menace. And so I just called myself Dennis because um, I was under the gun and I needed to come up with something really quick. And they were like, okay, Dennis. And that's how that, that came about. And I didn't really give it any thoughts until years later when I thought, you know, he was probably this hot shot martial artist, my, my character. And he was recruited by Terry Silver to uh, be the trainer or something. I've heard... Um, fan fiction rumors that you know he's he's terry's son but i was never told that i was never told that um dennis was related to terry or anything like that i just thought okay he's the guy who was good and dennis hired him i mean uh, silver hired him and i imagine that after that tournament that um he probably uh threw him to the curb you know fired him and uh uh, you know, that's that's my imagining of what happened to Dennis. In your mind, if Dennis were to cross paths with LaRusso again, does he still have that famous Cobra Kai grudge? <laughs> it, it, it can go one of two ways. It can either go like that, you know, where, you know, I haven't let it go and it's like, okay, we, we, we're going to have a rematch. Or we pass each other going into the Home Depot and I'm carrying a shoji screen and we do a double take where it's like, Nah, <laughs> we'll just keep going. 
it would be fun to be able to show that, yeah, uh, you know, I, I can do more than just get thrown into shoji screens. And I, I got a few good kicks left in me. So I think it would be fun if, um, if I could do that, if they could show some dimension to the character and what, you know, what his motivations are. If he's bad, let's find out why he's bad, just like they've done with the other characters. Or maybe he's not so bad and let's find out why he's not so bad. You know, uh, either way, it would be a fun ride. Forgive me for bringing this up, but you, you were one of the more, more notable martial artists to be in the film. And yet Dennis seems to be the only Cobra character that Daniel happens to throw aside no problem. What's with that? <laughs> I don't know if Dennis is just having a bad day. Maybe he's just got good PR, you know. But <laughs> think about this, is that Dennis, you know, if you rank his skill compared to, you know, you, you can say, well, where would Dennis, would Dennis be able to beat Mike? Would Dennis be able to beat Johnny? Would Dennis be able to meet Vidal? You know, would Dennis be able to beat Dutch? He hasn't even been able to beat Daniel yet, you know, <laughs> so... You know, in the rankings, if it was like an MMA world, you know, Dennis is kind of at the bottom of the list there, you know? Well, he got a, I think he got a, a big splinter in his hand when he did and he chopped that shoji screen and the, the wood went really, really deep and it created this infection and it just affected his performance and he just wasn't able to, he wasn't able to bring it when uh, he fought Daniel. That's... <laughs> Sounds legit. <laughs> you know what? That's... Uh, you're you're very um diligent in your observation and you're very very observant and very very little gets past you so I, I i appreciate that you noticed that because i've i've wondered that for years well to be fair i've probably watched all three of those films way past the healthy level so. <laughs> well I, you know i i have not been a big the biggest fan of karate kid three in you know, uh, and despite the fact that I'm in it, but I do believe that Cobra Kai makes it a better film. It fills in gaps and it kind of explains things, you know, and just like, I don't know if you've ever seen in the animated show, The Clone Wars, yes. you know? The Clone Wars makes Revenge of the Sith a better movie. Absolutely. That's what I think Cobra Kai does for, particularly the Karate Kid, two and three but particularly three mm -hmm. because think about this terry silver is this billionaire right he's like elon musk like if elon musk was going out and harassing an old man and a guy who was like 18 years old over karate schools or something like that it'd be like why would he do that right there it, it it doesn't make any sense and he'd be in a lot of trouble but now you're kind of going okay i can kind of buy into this now you know what I mean? Yeah. It fleshes out the context. It's actually giving more support to what we saw before. And, you know, I, I never really got a chance to hang out with Thomas Ian Griffith. He's a legitimate Taekwondo guy, and he is a tremendous actor, writer, producer. And I have a lot of respect for him in that regard. And he was playing over the Terry Silver over the top, not because he wanted to, but because John Albertson asked him to do it that way. You know, where he's like laughing maniacally. John's talking to Mr. Griffith saying, you know, it's Thomas, you know, play it like this. And he's like, uh, John, are you sure? And and he was, you know, he did it you know, to his credit, but he really wanted to make it more grounded. He wanted to make it more realistic because he's, he's, he's a, a, an actor who comes from theater, you know, and, but that over the topness made him memorable and as much as Karate Kid 3 was not liked as much as the other two, when it was announced that Terry Silver was coming back, the internet broke, right? Everybody was like, oh my God, Terry <laughs> Silver's coming back, right? you know? I have a question for you, and this is something that's bugged me for years about Karate Kid 3. Officially in the Karate Kid canon, the trilogy, Dennis is the only bad guy not to go up against Miyagi. However, when you watch the scene in the bonsai shop, there is a weird edit there where after he takes out Snake, Mike Barnes gestures to you and points to Miyagi and all of a sudden it cuts to Mike Barnes attacking. Is there a deleted scene where Snake did face off with Miyagi? There is a scene where the way we filmed it was Miyagi comes through the doors, Mike points at me, both Snake and I attack Miyagi, he takes us both out. And I threw a punch at Miyagi. He does this thing where he carries the arm on the outside and puts his hand on my elbow. So 
it's it's like it's like this kind of move and he pushes and then i go somersaulting over we filmed that and pat morita was the one who did it to me not from your demo so like he did that much to my surprise when we saw the finished film i was like oh it's 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 not there it's a weird jump and my thinking is that for some reason it just did not sell you know i tried to sell the hell out of it but it was almost like i i might have done it too much to where it, it just was like almost like miyagi's got jedi powers or something and he's just he goes and i just go you know and i i might have i might have oversold the thing but they didn't say anything to me at the time you know so i would have loved to see that but they're I still have this frame of somebody who was on set who took a picture and it's kind of blurry, but it does show me punching Miyagi and it shows him like this. I'll send it to you, but it's it's, an, it's a frame of uh, us and it's, it's proof that that does exist. Awesome. That is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> now you can see awesome. better now. I'll let you know. Oh, I, 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 like, I, I feel fulfilled now because I've wanted for years. <laughs> That's but I do want to point out a fun fact, though. Is, um, I'm probably, I don't know how many people have read this, but I actually do have the novelization of Karate Kid 3. Oh, my God. I think I'm in the novelization, and I'm described as a, the friend or something. It's like, I'm not... Believe it, yeah, because like, Snake doesn't exist. I believe it's just you and, and Mike Barnes in the book. And they don't call, they don't call me Dennis. I think it's called, and then, like, the, and then Mike Barnes' is friend or something like that. It's so... Well, I'm thrilled that you're still willing to talk about it and that you've, that you're still... Having fun with it. And yes, to answer your question, you are referred to as the thug. The thug. Okay. Well, there you go. But we know, it's, but we know it's Dennis, though. <laughs> well, that's really cool. So I, uh, I I do appreciate that. You know, I, I am grateful for the experience on Karate Kid 3, you know, and I'm, I'm you know, I, I'm still acting. I still do projects of my own. They're, you know, they're independent stuff. But Karate Kid 3 was my big, you know, it was a, it was a big opportunity for me. And I never knew that 30 some years later, I'd still be enjoying the benefits from that. You know, yeah. thank you for keeping Dennis alive. It came out the same summer as the original Batman, uh, the, the Tim Burton Batman, I believe, 1989. And um, yes. the other movie that was that summer was Star Trek V, directed by William Shatner. So uh, that's what I remember. And we did a preview screening for the cast and crew and John Appleson gets up and he says, Batman doesn't have a chance. And you, you know, everybody starts <laughs> cracking up, you know, because it was like, yeah, we think Batman's, Batman's gonna like bust through everything, you know. Th um, but that was a big summer. That was a real, because yeah. you, you're right, it was Karate Kid 3 and Batman and Star Trek, but there was also Back to the Future 2 and there was also Ghostbusters 2 the same summer. That's right. Oh, that's, that, that's an amazing summer. Oh my gosh. Yeah, that's awesome. You know, I just, I just really personally want to thank you for doing such a great job, doing what you're doing with your channel, always exploring, just trying to educate others, bring awareness to the other arts. I think that's such an important mission, especially we're in a world now where there's a lot of toxic politics where people are like, oh no, this my art's better than this art. I think just doing this open door policy of exploring other arts is so important just for everybody to appreciate what we're doing. So I just want to say thank you for the work that you're doing with your channel and for being available and spending time with me today to talk to our viewers and just kind of share your experience. Well, you know, since it's my honor and pleasure, and um, I'm happy to do it. Um, hopefully, uh, people will enjoy the interview, and you know, maybe get something positive out of it. And you know, I, I, you know, I strongly encourage you to keep doing what you're doing and doing it your way. And for all of our viewers out there, you know, the, the same. You know, it, it's got to be about people first. You know, all the other stuff will take care of itself. Thank you so much to Sensei William Christopher Ford for spending his time and sharing his experience with us. I highly encourage everyone to please go visit his channel and check out his short film, The Last Dojo. Anyone who likes martial arts history will be able to absolutely appreciate that, as well as his awesome 52 Master Series. He's got some great content, so please let's show him our support and go support his channel. Thank you all for watching, and as always, we welcome your feedback in the comments, like, subscribe, and we'll see you back on the mat next week.